And I want to show you a scripture, powerful scripture. Listen, as I'm speaking there, I feel a lot of anointing going through me. And I want you to believe it. Listen, I'm saying, I want your whole mindset to change. And I want to show you in the scriptures where it talks about the power of the promise. The best thing that can happen to you is that you are an heir of the promise. The best thing that has happened to you is that your life is regulated by promise and not by the law. Now listen to, look at what the Bible says. I'm going to read this, this passage. Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to read from verses 15 to 17. From 15 to 18. And I'm going to read it in ESV version. version. And because I like the way ESV puts it. So if you have ESV, you can flash it for us on the screen. But I'm reading ESV. And look at what it says. Galatians 3 from verse 15. Listen to me very carefully. It says, this is Apostle Paul. He's gone through a line of arguments and a line of reasoning. And I think he's trying to come to a conclusion. And then he says in verse 15, he says, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Once you've ratified the agreement, once you've ratified the promise, it cannot be annulled Neither can you add to it or oh, conditions. No. The sixteen says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say unto offsprings. Referring to many. But it refers to one and to your of spring, who is Christ? Verse 17. This is what I mean. The law, the rules, and the regulations, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. To the point of making the promise void. <laughs> Just your confidence is in the promise. For, I'm reading verse 18, if the inheritance comes by the law, in other words, by rules and regulations. I was explaining that from where we just read, it says, if the inheritance is given to you by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but your inheritance, your redemption, your sanctification, your health, your healing, your prosperity, your victory has been given to you by promise through Christ. And as a result of that, nothing can disannul it. Nothing can add to it. Even the law, the law cannot invalidate it. The law cannot come to you and say, well, you have not kept to the instructions of the law. Therefore, you are going to be deprived of your inheritance. Now, listen to me. If this is your confidence, you know it, that it is your inheritance, it's been given to you by promise. And the only way you can receive it is by faith in other words believe it accept it if you believe it and you accept it then that's it the point i'm trying to make here is this if you don't 
believe the promise, then you might have problems in experiencing the fulfillment of the promise. The point I'm, I'm making here is that you need to see God as a promise maker and see God as a promise keeper. Now, let me just use Sister Fuller's example. She says there are times that she's seeking God. She's asking God, oh, Lord, I need to know what's your counsel, what is your wisdom. Do you know his promise? His promise is that his son, Jesus Christ, is our wisdom. And that wisdom dwells in you. So no matter the case, I'm very confident in anticipating and expecting wisdom from God. I'm confident that God will not deny me of his wisdom because it's a promise. Wisdom is part of the package in the promise. My operating and assessing God's wisdom has nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with rules or regulations. It simply has to do with, do I believe that it's been given to me as a promise? So when you approach God, you approach him as your husband. You approach him as your father. You approach him as your shepherd. You approach him as your provider. You approach him as your shelter. You approach him as your fortress. Listen to me. Whatever you approach him as, just know that it is on the premise of the promise. It is not a conditional covenant. That's why it says the new covenant we have it's premised on better promises. In other words, there are promises that are guaranteed. They are guaranteed. On what basis? On the basis of the perfection and the basis of the obedience of Christ. That is why they are guaranteed. That is why if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 or so, it says, the promises of God, they are yea in Christ. They are also amen in Christ. In other words, every promise has been secured and, and, and um, settled in Christ. So you, it, it's like, you see, the promise is, is like a check. It's like a check. And let's, say, let's call it a bank check. Of course, bank draft. Maybe what's called is bank draft. And that bank draft from a bank, it's like a check from a bank. You know, somebody, a, a check, a bank writes out a check. That's what they call bank draft. And you have that bank draft. You are guaranteed that if you take that bank draft to a bank, you are more than guaranteed that whatever is on that bank draft, you will be able to conduct it from the bank. The bank must of necessity honor that draft. So, I see the promises of God as like their bank drafts. So all I need to do is to accept it. And how do I cash the bank draft of God? How do I cash the bank draft of his promises? Believe it. That's all. Believe it. Anticipate it and appropriate it. Now, why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this because I don't want a case of where, <laughs> because I've done bad, because I've done this, or because I've done that, then it now begins to affect or compromise my expectation from God. Am I making sense? So it was part of it was part of a sister, sister Fuller's mix. What she said, and sometimes she feels well because I've done bad. Yeah, that's why this is happening. Or that's, that's why that is happening. No, no. Let not, in other words, let me put it this way. Let not my circumstances, let not my, my um, the events around me, let not my actions or non-actions affect my expectation from God. Now, let me say this. You may ask, okay, if, if I just see God as a promise maker and a promise keeper, what about, is God not a holy God? And 
will not tolerate unrighteous living. Let me tell you the truth. Part of the promise of God for which you should believe is that it doesn't just make you holy, but he has, he has given you a righteous nature that is inclined to do righteous things. That's one. Two, he has put his spirit inside of your spirit. And his spirit, somebody used the word navigate, navigates us. His spirit um, 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 leads us, guides us, counsels us. Church, this is what I expect us to, this is the confidence I want you to have. And when you have this confidence, then you can, you can rest. There'll be a restedness in you. Do you understand what I'm saying? There'll be a restedness in you. I give you the example of Ruth last, last Sunday. See, Ruth came into a place that she's not used to. Came back to her in laws place, back to the land of Israel. But it looks like she's desolate. She's lost her husband. She's lost her father-in-law. She's lost her brother-in-law. So she's just with her mother-in-law. It looks like she's desperate, but she's not ignorant of the grace of God. And so she says, I want to go and glean in a field where I will find grace. That's the expectation, church. That is the expectation of um, a Moabite test. And so it is for us. If you will anticipate and expect the blessings of God. If you expect a fulfillment of the promise, that is how it will be for you. Bible says her heart was to light upon the field of Boaz. That is what her destiny turned out to be. Why? Because of her expect. What are you expecting? What are you expecting? I'm expecting the fulfillment of the promise. No, 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 Robert, you can't expect the fulfillment of the promise. How have you been brought by this? No, 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 no. Just expect that some privileges are going to be withdrawn from you. How can I expect privileges to be withdrawn from me? Is the promise conditional? No, the promise is not conditional. What should rule and regulate and govern your life is the promise. God has promised you that you are going to be blessed. You're going to be triumphant. You're going to be victorious. You're going to excel. That case closed. There's no addition to it. I'm expecting to be, I'm expecting to be triumphant. In fact, God has promised me to be fruitful. I'm also expecting to be fruitful. God has promised me that I'll be a blessing. I'll be blessed and I'll be a blessing to others. Guess what? I'm not just expecting to be blessed. I'm expecting that God is going to open avenues for me to be a blessing to multitudes. Expectation, expectation is a key thing. How? How do you perceive God? Let me tell you the truth. Let me, let me just ask you this question. Why do you think? Why do you think that you need to pray? Just, I, I, I'm, I'm not condemning anyone. I'm just saying this. But let's think. Is God a kind God? Is he a kind God? Is he kind? Is he kind-hearted? Is he like a father? Is he compassionate? Is he merciful? Is he quick to forgive? Does he know your needs? In fact, the Bible says he knew it all, all your needs. Even before you ask, your father knows you and you have need of them. Now, if this is my father and he's a promise keeper, he's a promise maker and the promise keeper, why do you think that to receive of his promise, I have to? labor and labor and labor in pray, in fasting for long hours, for long days, for weeks, for him to give me what he knows I have need of. Do you know why we can think like that? It's the perception you have of God. 
many of us are thinking that God is well, is, is reluctant to release what we have need of. God takes pleasure in seeing us begging him. Oh God, please, Lord. Lord, please. Oh Lord, please. You know how much I need this thing. You know how much I've been suffering. You know how unbearable it is. Please, Lord. Then the following day again. Then the following day again, you come back to him. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, you know my precarious situation. You know how terrible it is for me. Lord, please. You come the third day, all crying, beggarly, pleading, crying. Then, fifth day, you're going to fast it. You fast, you fast, you fast, and you are pleading with God. You are pleading and pleading. Pleaded for one week, pleaded for two weeks, pleaded for three weeks, pleaded for two months, pleaded for five months, pleaded for six months. Listen to me. If that is how you respond to your child, will your child not say, hey, this is my mom is wicked. <laughs> Why will mommy be so reluctant to give me this thing I'm asking for? And mommy knows I need it. That's not God. All that God wants you to do is come within the He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Let's see this here, an issue of sickness or disease. I come boldly to the throne. I'm not coming beggarly. I am a son. I'm an heir. Heir of the promise. So I come boldly to the throne. Father, I, you know, you see the kind of boldness I'm coming with. Father, I thank you because I have the righteousness of Christ. Christ is my righteousness. And it's on that premise that I come boldly to your throne. Lord, your word says that I am more than a conqueror. I am an overcomer. Your word says that I have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places by Christ Jesus. Your word says that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything I can ask or think about. Your word says that through Christ, I have all sufficiency in all things at all times. Your word says Christ himself bore all my infirmities in his own body. On that basis, I say, Thank you for healing. I thank you for my prosperity. I thank you for my deliverance. I thank you for answered prayers. Confident. Father, I know it's done. Go to sleep. Tomorrow, when you come to God on the same matter, don't stop begging. Continue to thank him. Father, I thank you because the supply is already here. Father, I thank you because you have already answered me. Father, I thank you because I can see, look at the words that Sister Paula posted to us. I can see, tell him, I can see. Devil comes to you, say, no, but where is it? You can't see it physically. I can see it with the, uh, with the eyes of faith, with the eyes of my heart. I can see the supply. I can see the answered prayers. I can see the glory of God. I can see that impossibility become possible. That is our that is the disposition with which we should approach things. Then not in the introspective way, well, I don't know this delay. Huh? I know maybe God is trying to use it to teach me a lesson. Maybe God is trying to use it to punish me for what I've done. No, don't think that way, please. Don't, don't think that way. Uh, don't think that way. Don't have that wrong impression of God. God is not that way. Listen to me. How many of you have ever seen? Many of us here. You will know how many of us on this platform, you'll be able to testify of how kind-hearted your father was to you. Your father may not be kind-hearted to his colleagues at work. 
Your father may not be kind-hearted to other people around him, but to you, his daughter, or to you, his son, your father must have had a very obvious, noticeable, kind-hearted disposition. And on that basis, it gives you an impression of how fathers are meant to be. That is why the greatest revelation of God, the, of God to us through Christ is God is our father. So if you see him as a loving, kind-hearted, compassionate, merciful, long-suffering God who has no air of wrath in him because Jesus Christ has caused all, or Jesus Christ has pacified all his wrath, then it should affect your anticipation and your expectation of it. Am I making sense? Right. So, I have read to you in the scriptures, what is the promise? The question now is, what is the promise? My best description of the promise is in Romans 4, I think it's 15, where it says, the promise that Abraham will be the heir of the, of the world. So the pro that same promise, you have it. Your, the promise is that you'll be the heir of the world. And that promise, God is constantly at work to bring a manifestation of airship in the totality of your life. God wants to demonstrate and prove to the world that you are the heir of the world. But he needs your cooperation. And what is your co the cooperation he wants? He wants you to accept it. He wants you to believe it. He wants you to expect it.